Hi everybody, Golden Era Bookworm here and I have been meaning to create this video for such a long time. I constantly refer to the Bronze Era, the Silver Era and the Golden Era without ever having explained as to why I consider certain time frames belonging to such a defined era. So to address this issue, because I do get asked constantly as to the time frames and different eras, I thought I would finally define these eras in this video. Of course, this only serves as my opinion. In order to define these eras, it became apparent to me that there has to be similar factors shared within a certain time frame to define it as so. These of course reflect the evolution of the sport, with defining moments or practices that truly show the transition from one period to the next. These factors need to be based on factors that are important to our sport of bodybuilding. These factors logically therefore include things like diet and nutrition, the exercises and style of training, the use or absence of synthetic steroids and the public's perception to the sport of physical culture and bodybuilding. With these factors in mind, it becomes easier to group each period logically into an era and allows one to then define certain personalities and events in the sport to each specific era. Looking first at the Bronze Era, in my opinion, the Bronze Era can be defined as the period prior to the 1930s, therefore the 1800s up until the end of the 1920s. This era which was synonymous with strongmen first and foremost and less with bodybuilding was also the pre-steroid era. During this time, synthetic testosterone and its derivatives did not exist at all, and therefore all the physiques developed during this period can be considered bona fide natural. The Bronze Era was the time of the names and glorious physiques of such supermen as Professor Attila, Apollon, Eugene Sandow, the Saxon brothers, Al Trella, Maxic, Lionel Strongfort, Louis Sir, Charles Rigolo, and Ernest Kdean, Otto Arco, Sigmund Klein, George Hackenschmidt, and Bobby Pandur, just to name a few. These men's physiques were either large in proportion, like that of Louis Sir, or muscular and defined, with outstanding arm and shoulder development, and still well-defined legs and chest muscles. And this was a reflection, of course, of the training methods used back then. These strong men were known for gathering audiences that would fill halls with screaming enthusiasts as they would lift superhuman poundages and flex their mighty muscles to the thousands of adoring fans. They were strong men working as professionals, wrestlers and in circuses. And during these exhibitions would not just lift enormous poundages but perform all sorts of strength feats and odd lifts like the Tomb of Hercules made famous by Eugene Sandow or lifting humans on the Roman chair or breaking chains, bending coins, crushing axe, tearing decks of cards and countless other feats. Their training methods were truly a sight to behold as well. Bodybuilding was at its infancy back then, and the training was heavily influenced by its Germanic roots of Tornen, a sport that combined gymnastics and the lifting of barbells and dumbbells which thrived in Europe at the time, which is where many of these strongmen originated from. The weight training practices involved odd lifting, such as one-handed lifts like one-handed snatches, clean and jerks and swings and presses etc, as well as two-handed lifts like the clean and jerk, the snatch and the press, which later became the standard three lifts during the Olympics, and later only the snatch and the clean and jerk would formally comprise Olympic weight lifting. Therefore, it is correct to say that these men of the Bronze Era were the forefathers of modern Olympic weightlifting. Besides training for strongman feats of strength alongside the odd lifting practices, the Bronze Era strongmen were the forefathers of bodybuilding too. One man in particular, Eugene Sandow, had much to do with the formulation and expansion of the sport. Eugene Sandow, who was taught by Professor Attila, is known by many as the father of modern bodybuilding. Unlike many of his prior strongman contemporaries, not only did he perform feats of strength on stage, but he learned to display his muscles and was one of the first ever strongmen to include a posing routine into his strongman acts.
In doing so, the appreciation of the human physique returned and awakened from its darkness, so to speak. And I say that because if we look at the Renaissance art, it is obvious that the human physical form was appreciated hundreds of years ago, but then this was lost. Eugene Sandow brought this appreciation of the human physical form back, and in doing so, gave birth to the art of bodybuilding. Through his countless courses and home exercise equipment, his message was health for all. His propagation of a healthy lifestyle through his light dumbbell system would lead to the opening of physical culture studios everywhere, the birth of supplements as well as the birth of the fitness industry. One final topic to consider is nutrition. During the Bronze Era, strongmen did not portion their macros like we do today. Diets deferred as they do today, and much was based on different factors like the origin of the strongman or whether they had done any research. For example, those of European origin followed mainly a heavy meat, beer and potato diet, eating mountain loads of food, whilst others like Bernard McFadden preached on the values of various kinds of vegetarian diets. Eugene Sandow did market a cocoa drink as a sports supplement and Plasmon, which was the world's first true protein supplement. To close off this section of the Bronze Era, Eugene Sandow's influence was great during the Bronze Era as it would set the standard that many other strongmen would then follow. Sandow's success proved a very important point to other strongmen during the Bronze Era, and that is that it just wasn't important to be strong, but to truly be successful and stand out from the crowd, one had to have a beautiful physique as well. After the propagation of bodybuilding by the likes of Eugene Sandow and his contemporaries, in my opinion, the 1930s up until the end of the 1950s is the era I define as the Silver Era. It is during this era in which the physiques of strongmen, weightlifters and bodybuilders truly shifted apart and could easily be distinguished. While some of the strongmen of the Bronze Era were still around like Sigmund Klein, these men served as gym instructors to the new up-and-comers of the Silver Era. The bodybuilders of the Silver Era were in awe of the super strength of the strongmen before them, and dreamed of acquiring strength and big muscles, and didn't they? In my opinion, as well as that of several other bodybuilding historians, is that this desire to be massive and strong came from a need which was born out of the desperation during and after the Second World War. Men were thin and felt weakened. The country called for stronger men of mind and muscle, and the men of this generation of the Silver Era heeded that call and followed suit. The physiques of John Grimmick, Steve Reeves, Reg Park, Marvin Eder, Clarence Ross and George Eiferman during this transition period still are outstanding to this day. What sets these physiques apart from the strongmen of the Bronze Era is the more complete development of the human physique. These men looked like true supermen in comparison, with now well-developed chests and much improved development in the legs and calves. Most had also developed a large rib cage, and again these changes were due to the changing and evolving training methods. The Silver Era bodybuilders, besides still practicing odd lifting and Olympic weightlifting like their forefathers, began to incorporate the breathing squat, thanks to the development of this exercise and system by Joe Heese. The breathing squat when combined with the breathing pullover and an increase in the consumption of milk was found to put on muscular bulk on the trainee. The incorporation of the breathing squat system along with the propagation of the bench press which was made popular by George Hackenschmidt is what many historians consider to be responsible for the massive difference in the physiques between the Bronze Era and the Silver Era. Again, the massive ribcage and chest development was so obvious between these two eras. It is also important to point out that during the Silver Era, the different physique standards that would later become the standard were set for classic physique, and we can also see its transition from strongman to V-tapered physiques. 
If we observe the physique and abilities of John Grimmick, we can see the massive yet elegant physique attained by Grimmick, yet he was known to perform strongman feats and his development can be said to even resemble that of a strongman in that his chest was not as massively developed. Later, of course, came Steve Reeves, who truly introduced the classical V-tapered look, with wide shoulders, flaring lats, the tiny waist, well-developed arms and legs, and bulging calves. Reeves was truly the forerunner in regards to the V-tapered look. Finally, the Clarence Rosses, Reg Parks, and Bill Pearls of the day combined both mass and aesthetics to set the standards for the golden era bodybuilders to follow, and therefore were still able to compete with them during the golden era of bodybuilding. These bodybuilders were massively developed yet retained a tiny waist which looked aesthetically pleasing and made them look like statues in living form. Nutrition became increasingly important to bodybuilders during the Silver Era who strived for more massively impressive physiques. It is during this time that many began experimenting with higher protein foods like eggs and milk, liver, and high-dose vitamins. The Silver Era diet, mainly consisting of whole natural foods, also focused on foods that were higher in protein and fat. And so came the nutritional gurus such as Gaylord Hauser, then Irvin Johnson who was later known as Rio H. Blair, and of course Vince Gironda. These men began experimenting with what many would consider radical diets back then, and would also experiment on their own clients, and the changes were of course obvious and the message clear. Protein foods increased muscle and fast. These early high-protein diets saw massive changes in the muscular bulk of bodybuilders and subsequently led to the explosion of the supplement industry. In particular, Rio H. Blair would come out with a line of high-protein foods and supplements that would later be all the craze during the golden era. At the same time, both the weeders in the IFBB camp were having an all-out magazine war with York's Bob Hoffman in the Muscle Mag world, selling their respective barbells and dumbbells and courses, and fighting over which training method was best, with of course the weeders selling bodybuilding as best, whilst the York team selling weightlifting as the best and only way to train and develop a strong and muscular physique. Both camps would also join the supplement bandwagon and produce their own line of supplements as they realized that this was an industry where a steady stream of income could be made. It is of course very important to point out that during the mid-1930s, synthetic testosterone was first created. And although medical experts have argued that the derivatives available were not as potent and prescribed in small doses to target depression and treat hypogonadic men, there are still those who believe that all silver era bodybuilders experimented with testosterone. In my opinion, this is likely not the case. I have read the books and literature and spoken to the lifters of the silver era and all agree that the first time bodybuilders and weightlifters used testosterone was during the mid-1950s, after Dr. Ziegler found out that the Russians were using it to train their athletes for the Olympic Games. John Grimmick admittedly tried testosterone after his retirement from bodybuilding and was rather disappointed with the result as was the rest of the York gang that tried it, who were of course representing the US in the Olympic Games and were trying to even out the playing field by experimenting with testosterone. Because of the disappointing results and lack of potency of synthetic testosterone back in the day, Dr. Ziegler was told to develop a stronger derivative of testosterone and of course, Dianabol was born, and as they say, the rest is history. Dianabol was first synthesized in 1958, and it is at this point, that is the late 50s and into the early 60s, that I would consider the beginning of the golden era of bodybuilding. The golden era of bodybuilding was of course, in the opinion of many, including myself, the period during the 1960s up until the end of the 1970s where bodybuilders developed the most beautiful and aesthetic physiques based on the lessons and developments of their silver era forefathers. Some, like Louis Marco, extend this period up to the late 80s. 
Understanding the importance of nutrition, correct training, and the administration of relatively small doses of anabolic steroids in short cycles prior to competition, the physiques developed during the golden era set the standard to the now classical physique that has re-emerged recently. The Silver Era forefathers had already developed the training methods such as the standard, set system, supersets, compound sets and giant sets, the cheating principle, forced reps and training to failure, and many of the other principles that would be simply adopted by the Golden Era greats. It was the Silver Era Titans before them that developed these methods, as well as the nutritional principles that have stood the test of time, and I just need to point that out. However, what was it that sets the Golden Era legends from the Titans from the Silver Era? It was the collective development of bodybuilding that was so intelligently put together that led to the creation of these phenomenal physiques of the Golden Era. The Golden Era legends built on the foundation laid by the Silver Era greats, which is why the Golden Era greats held such high respect for the Silver Era Titans. And who can blame them? The physiques created during the Golden Era were truly masterpieces. Physiques like that of Larry Scott, Sergio Oliva, Dave Draper, Freddie Ortiz, Harold Poole, Chuck Sipes, Don Howarth, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Frank Zane, Franco Colombo, Serge Nebre, Lou Ferrigno, Mike Mensah, Boya Co, Robbie Robinson, Chris Dickerson, Mike Katz, Danny Padilla, Ken Waller, Roger Callard, and many, many more. To help them and guide them along the way were the likes of Vince Gironda, the Iron Guru, Joe Weeder and Bill Pearl who still competed at the time and was known as the first bodybuilder to ever use a synthetic steroid known as Nilovar. In regards to nutrition, a high protein and high fat diet was always on the menu and helped golden era bodybuilders reach definition and conditioning that had never been appreciated before. The physiques of the golden era were both more massive and more muscular and ripped. Thanks, of course, to the use of ketogenic diets that both Rio H. Blair and Vince Gironda advocated. And of course, the physiques were enhanced further with the help of anabolic cycles, which increased both protein synthesis and fat metabolism, which simultaneously increased muscle mass and increased fat loss, leading to the more massive, vascular and ripped physiques that were displayed in the day. It is also important to note that although high volume training systems were employed for short periods of times by silver era bodybuilders prior to competition, it was the golden era bodybuilders who, with the help of anabolic steroids, could employ such high volume training systems for extended period of times, that is months at a time, to further chisel down their physiques like an artist would a statue until the desired look was achieved. With Pumping Iron popularizing the sport and singing the merits of bodybuilding and Arnold and Lou exploding onto the screen, bodybuilding became mainstream into the 80s with the gym and fitness industry as well as the supplement industry becoming billion dollar industries. Since then, of course, the mass monster era was brought on in the early 90s by Dorian Yates, and this look has lasted until recent times when classic physique has re-emerged to try and emulate the physiques of the golden era. So that is my definition of the different eras of bodybuilding, namely the bronze era, the silver era, and the golden era. I do hope you have enjoyed this video, which has been as much of a celebration of our sport as it has been a historical view of its timeline and the achievements, developments, and evolution of bodybuilding. If you have enjoyed the video, please give the video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't done so and leave me your comments. That's it from me. This is the Golden Era Bookworm saying bye for now. Now, if you're interested in learning more about Vince Deronda's approach to bodybuilding, his principles, and all these tips of wisdom that he has, I mean, there's so much stuff that probably hasn't been proven by science, and it will take science to prove or disprove uh, Vince. But to be honest, these three books, I believe, which I call the Classic Physique Bundle, are the best books that Vince ever came out with. And they, of course, are the Wild Physique, the Master Series, and the Pro Series. Have a look at it this way. The Wild Physique, I believe, is like the ABCs 
of Vince Gironda's principles to bodybuilding. He teaches you the exercises and his principles. But how do you put them together? Well, the Master Series is a 14-month program of using all of these principles, all of the diets that Vince came out with, all of the exercises. And believe me, it's a brilliant, brilliant program. Many people have used it. I know I know personally a lot of uh, bodybuilders that have actually used it and uh, f made fantastic results with it. And of course, the Pro Series was a book that he came out with later on, specially targeted for uh, getting into competition. It's just the, these three books, as I call it, the Classic Physique Bundle, uh, Vince's best work, and available, of course, at www.goldenerabookum.com. Now, the Pro Series of Bodybuilding, which was targeted for professional bodybuilders, is a contains six programs, each of which go for two months each, so it's a whole year, uh, again, in preparation for competition. Need a bodybuilding poster for your gym or office? Then check out ironmanmagazinearchive.smugmug.com for the highest quality posters on the planet. Scroll through the galleries of all the legends, including greats such as Arnold, Frank Zane, Sergio Oliva, Serge Nubre, Tom Platz, and Larry Scott, and much, much more, and select your poster now. To support your favorite YouTube channel, please visit teespring.com slash store slash golden era bookworm for merchandise, including t-shirts, hoodies, face masks, phone cases, and much, much more. Once again, at teespring.com slash store slash golden era bookworm. Become a patron at www.patreon.com forward slash golden era bookworm for hard to find books, scans of rare photos and articles on the golden era of bodybuilding. To take full advantage of my collaborations, use code GEB20 with nspnutrition.com and vincegeronda.com as well as code bookworm12 at osl.com for a discount at checkout.